All right, I'm going to get right into it. Uh, I'm sure we'll have a few people walking in, uh, but I want to uh, get through the lecture so everybody has plenty of time to work on uh, the sandbox for this week and play around with this stuff. Today we're going to get into what are called operators and expressions in Python. Operators are simple symbols and collections of symbols that have a special reserved meaning in Python, uh, typically to do some sort of a calculation or operation on two variables, two or more variables, and produce a result. So those are operators, and any uh, line of code that contains multiple variables and an operator is called an expression. So operators and expressions. An expression always has a result. Could be a number, could be a string, uh, could be a Boolean value but every operator has some kind of a result, or every expression, rather. This is a bit of review, but just to remind you of the type function. The type function returns a string that indicates the type of the object that you give it. So it takes, uh, it takes multiple parameters, but the one we're really concerned with is the object parameter, and that's the, the main required uh, parameter and it will return a string indicating the type of that specified object. So for example, if I have um, if I have an int value, let's say I create an integer, if I want to see what that is, I can use print in conjunction with the type to return int value, and when I run that, oops, don't need to debug that, it doesn't have any bugs, but it's the same as running it. What it prints out is the class, it's that it's a class called int, so it's an integer. This is useful for a lot of reasons. The main reason that you might want to use this is to help you debug programs because a lot of times you try to do something with the variable and it gives you some kind of a weird error, especially if you, you get a type error, you can sort of use that to debug what's going on because a lot of times a variable might be something other than what you think it is in terms of its type and it won't let you do whatever it is you're trying to do with that type of variable. So it's really useful to have this type function and remember that. Um, a sort of related set of functions, and this float is an example of this type, uh, is are these type conversion functions. Float, as the name implies, will convert whatever variable or object you feed it into a float. And that is provided that that object or variable value can be converted into a float. You can't take a word like house as a string and convert that into a float, there's no way to do that. But if you have any set of digits or numbers as a string, in this case 3.5 is already in the form of a float, but, so that's an easy one, uh, but you can take an integer and convert it into a float as well. On the opposite end, the str function will take any object and convert it into a string. The biggest difference between a, a, a function like float or int, the one that converts things to an integer, and the str function is that almost anything can be converted into a string. Uh, there are very few ways to make this error out because an, an integer, a float, Boolean, those can all be converted to strings. So. If you are working with output that you are splicing together or working with it in the form of a string, it's a pretty easy target. If you're trying to put two strings together and it's giving you a type error, the easiest thing to do is convert all of those to, to actual strings using this function to make sure that they're strings. Um, so this is a nice one to have sort of in your back pocket as well. So getting into operators. Operators are math and um, it's pretty basic math. This is not a computer science course that requires like calculus level knowledge. This is 
basic algebra and even below that, mostly arithmetic. Um, but even so, if you're majoring in computer science and the math part is intimidating to you, let me just encourage you to not get in over your head uh, before it's time, not get overwhelmed by things before you actually get into them. Because I think although computer science has some pretty math heavy stuff and even software development requires some math, um, letting yourself get intimidated by that is is a bit premature. I think a lot of people find that once you get into it, it's not so bad. But in this case, in this class, we're starting very basic. The very first, the most common, the one that you've already used, the equal sign is called the assignment operator. And all that means is you're taking a variable and you're saying this variable is this value. In other words, you're putting the value of three, the integer three, into the variable x. So assignment. So x in this case equals three, because we just said x equals three. Addition, the addition operator, pretty obvious, plus sign. In this case, you're taking two values and adding them together. So x equals three plus one. What does x equal in this case? Four. Boy, somebody should have had a more nutritious lunch, I guess. Um, so yeah, addition. So x equals four in this case. Subtraction, another oldie but a goodie. In this case, x equals three minus one. X equals two, right? Uh, don't forget in addition, uh, you can use addition with strings. And when you add two strings together, it doesn't try and convert them and do math with them. It just takes those two strings and puts them together. If one of those things is not a string, though, you're going to have trouble because it gets confused. Do I do math or do I put them together like strings? It just says, no, I'm not going to do either one. I'm just going to complain about it. Multiplication. This is probably not the symbol you're used to seeing for multiplication. This is an asterisk. It's the symbol that is right over the number eight key on your keyboard. And we use that instead of a dot or instead of the X because both of those symbols are already taken and used for other things. So the asterisk, and you'll find it's pretty universal. Most computer programming languages use the asterisk for multiplication. So X equals three times two or right six. You're getting the idea. Division, again, you may or may not be used to seeing division represented as, as this. The forward slash, you can tell the difference between a forward slash and a backslash because a forward slash is leaning in the direction you read. So if it's leaning to the right and you read from left to right, that's a forward slash. Okay, so the forward slash, x equals 9 divided by 3 or 3, right? Um, oops, fat fingers. So, um... If you want to think about this at, in the fractional terms, it's 9 over 3. If you want to think of this in, in your picture in your head as a long division problem, the 9 goes inside, right? Inside the symbol. Uh, so here's probably a new one for you, even if you're uh, programmed in other languages. An exponent is symbolized by two asterisks together. Typically, if we're an exponent, we use the caret symbol in other languages. Python's a little bit unique here, but this reads as two to the fourth power. So two times two times two times two, or 16. Okay. Modulus is my favorite operator, not just because it has a cool name, but also because it's so useful. Modulus does division between these two numbers, so divides 10 by three, but it doesn't return the answer to that, it returns the remainder. So the modulus, or the, the result of 10 modulus three is one, because 10 divided by three is 9.3333 forever and ever. So it drops, it, it or, or nine with a remainder of one, and so it returns the one. And the result of a modulus, by the way, 
is an integer. Interestingly enough, I forgot to tell you the result of division, always a float. Always a float because more often than not, it's, it's going to result in some kind of a decimal. But even if it goes evenly, in this case, it would come back at 3.0. So just so you know, modulus is always an integer. Floor division is sort of the companion to modulus. It divides these two numbers and, gets, and just gets rid of the uh, remainder. So how many times does it go in? And let's forget about the remainder. So 10 floor, di floor divided by 3 is 3. Yeah. Both of those are very useful. Okay, there are lots and lots of applications where you want to know how many times does something go into something or does this big, huge number go evenly into this other big, huge number? Use modulus. And if, the, if it comes back with 0, you know it goes evenly. So those are really nice functions to have. You wouldn't think you'd use them very much, but you actually do. It's kind of kind of funny. And those are very common, by the way, very common operators in most computer programming languages, especially ones that are used for scientific pursuits. Yeah. Normal division. In normal division, the answer would be, well, let's just let's this is a good good time for me to write some code. Okay, so let's do this. Int value equals 10. Uh, int, well, let's just forget that. Let's keep it really simple and not even do variables. How about that? Okay, so print 10 divided by 3, right? So I print 10 divided by 3, and that's the result, 10 divided by 3. So if I go floor division, 10 divided by 3, gets rid of the remainder, right? And then 10 modulus 3 will, will, will just return 1 because all it gives you is the remainder. So you could, you could do, without doing a decimal, if you wanted to do division that showed the whole number and a whole number remainder, you could use the floor division and the modulus together to come up with the whole number and the remainder. That's another way that people use that sometimes. Question? Always an integer, because um, because it just does. Yeah. So t it's like ten divided by five, though. Like I said, always comes back a float, even if it's even if it goes evenly. It just that just it's one of those things that you just kind of like either you remember it or you get reminded of it at some point. Luckily, float and integer are relatively compatible. It's not like a string and a float. You know what I mean? So it, it is a little bit better. Another one of my favorites is the increment operator. This is a nice shortcut for incrementing a variable. So if I want, if let's say I have a variable called X and I want it to count up, I could say each time I could go x, x, like let's say x equals 1 to start with. If I go x equals x, so 1 equals 1 plus 3, then it would equal 4. Because x equals x plus 3, if x is 1, then it's 4. So let's look at this in code, because it's a little weird. So if I go x equals 1, and then I say x equals x plus 1. And then I print x. Then x is going to equal 2. Because when I added this line of x equals x plus 1, the value of x started at 1. And then it incremented. But the faster way to write this I could save myself a couple keystrokes by writing x plus equals 1. So if I write x plus equals 1, then I get the same thing. 
So if I wanted to create a program that counted, I would just set up a while loop here. And now, oops, my bad. Got killed by the capitalization bug here. Okay, so now my computer's just counting really, really fast. It's already like three or four or five, six million something. Um, kind of a boring program, but you get the idea. So each time this loops through, it X goes up by one and then it prints it. Then it goes by one, then it prints it, then it goes by one, and I'll just do that until my computer explodes or dies, which probably will be a while before that happened. Um, eventually it would come to a number so big it would crash my computer because it would run out of memory, but that, that would also take quite a while. So increment, so plus equals is how you, add it, you increment a variable by that number. You can also do it with subtraction, division, exponents, um, and uh, floor division. So all of those are available as options. Okay, so I would be remiss if I didn't mention order of operations. If you've taken algebra, you kind of have a sense of order of operations, okay? It's the correct order for processing a math problem. So, for example, if I have three plus one times four, right? The answer to that could be done by saying three plus one equals four, and then four times four equals 16, right? But that would be wrong because the way I should be doing this is the opposite way. And instead of adding three plus one, I should do the, the multiplication first. So three plus one times four, which is four equals seven. So depending on which order I do those operations in, I could get completely different answers. So there is a universally accepted correct way of processing the order of operation. And if you want to remember this word, it doesn't mean anything. PEMDAS, P-E-M-D-A-S, helps you. It's a mnemonic device that helps you remember the order of operations. So you go parentheses, exponents, multiplication and division, addition and subtraction in that order. And then always from right to left. So if I wanted to solve this problem, which calculation would I do first? Which one? This one here? Remember, you always go right to left. So parentheses first, right to left. So this becomes five plus four. And then I do this parentheses, which inside these parentheses, which, which thing do I do first? Four to the power of five, which is, any math whizzes in here? 1024, I beat you. No, I just did this earlier. Um, so 1024 times two is 2048 plus three, 2051. So this all becomes 2051. So I have five plus four times 2051 plus 30 divided by six. Now going left to right, I have four times 2051. Yeah. Exactly. And then plus five plus five. So that's, that is the order that Python will use when interpreting that formula. What I would say is number one, it's important to remember the order of operation. So you don't screw up a formula when you're putting into Python and get the wrong answer. Second thing is 
You can put parentheses anywhere you want. Even when it's redundant, even when it's not necessary, I could put parentheses around this just so that in my brain, I, I'm grouping parts of my equation. And parentheses are really nice way to do that. Yeah, it's a little bit redundant. But if you're a kind of a visual person and you, seeing that helps you remember what, what gets done in which order, that's totally okay to do. It does not affect the outcome unless you put parentheses in a, in a place where it's not logical, then it would mess things up. Such as if I put parentheses around this, then it becomes five plus four and that gets multiplied at times 2048, drastically changing the outcome, right? So you need to know what it is you're doing but if you keep this in mind, parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition and subtraction from left to right, then you can do this. Also, another thing that helps me, because I'm, I'm not what you would call a math guy, okay? I've had lots and lots of stats. I don't have a computer science graduate degree, okay? So I'm, I'm, not, what, I'm not super strong with math. But what I do in situations like this where I have a complex formula is I might break it down into steps and use variables. So I might take this code, if I'm building a formula, and instead of this, I might write this, Oops, I might write what I want that part to be, and then it'll substitute it in. And then it's breaking the formula, it's kind of peeling it apart for myself so that it makes a little bit more sense. That's just, some, that's just a trick that I use when I'm dealing with complex formulas. It helps me, it's not necessary. It, if you were building this inside of a machine model, machine learning model, where it was running like a billion times a second, um, it would slow it down a little bit. But for 99.9% .9 of all of the things you ever build in your whole life, nobody will ever notice a speed difference if you do something like this. Plus, you know what you can do? Another way to do this is you can build it out in parts, and then you can just assemble it at the end. If, if things are getting too complicated for your brain, as they often do with mine, the best thing you can do is break it into smaller problems. That's a, a basic principle of computer science. Deconstruction or breaking it down into simpler problems and then solving those individual problems and then reconstructing it on the other side. So that's a viable strategy, not like, oh, you're using a crutch or you're not as smart. Or, no, that's just, it's just good practice, period. So... For today, we're going to do just a sandbox today. So S3, you'll find a, a discussion forum in Canvas called S3 under Module 3. Not for a grade, just for practice. I want you to spend some time playing around with this stuff. And one of the examples that I'd like to suggest that you try first is a, a formula that finds the average of three numbers. So create three variables give them numbers and find the average. One thing I would suggest is start with numbers that you already know the answer to. So if you go eight, 10 and 12, the average of those three numbers is 10. So if you know the answer when you're building the program, then, then you automatically know if you did it right or not, because if it comes out to the right answer, then you're probably good. Then you can test it with another set of numbers maybe that you know the answer to, like one, two, and three, right? The average of those is two. Any, any three sequential numbers averaged are always gonna be the middle of that sequence. Fun fact. Um, I didn't say I didn't like math. I just said I wasn't a genius at it. Um, so you wanna think about what the formula is. What's the formula for finding the average of three numbers? Yeah, so add, add the numbers, 
and divide the total by three because there's three numbers. And can we express that in Python? Sure, you bet. Easy, right? So if we have int one, int two, and int three as our numbers, 10, if we can type, 11, 12. So answer, I uh, better follow my own rule, which would mean it's a float. Float answer equals, and I'm gonna use parentheses because we have to add them first, int one plus int two plus int three, and then divide all of that by three, and then print float answer, right? So there's a basic formula. And as, as, as I said, any three numbers in sequence, the middle one is the average, okay? And it will come back as a float, even if they were all integers, even if it's an even number. So play around with stuff like this. Look up things like the formula to convert metric units to, you know, stupid yards or like um, maybe Celsius to Fahrenheit or something like that. Try different scientific conversions. Play around. Um, see about how you would um, present the answer to this. Now, remember... Don't do this. Why not? It will not like that. You are correct. So I can do this. That's an easy way to do it. Print them both on the same line. Or I could do this and do an on the fly string conversion of that float. So it would go the same way. So there are lots of different ways to do things. And that's kind of one of the great things about programming is it gives you a lot of creative freedom in how to do things. So play around with stuff. Uh, I could also, right, use, as we did last time, I could use an F string to substitute that in. So lots of ways to solve problems. It's fun. Uh, already in your in your programming assignments, when I go to grade them, I went to look at the Mad Libs, I've probably seen 30 different solutions to that same problem. And they're all good, they all work. So when I grade them, I'm just looking at what you did and, and I, sometimes I run the code and it, if it works, great. But uh, for stuff like this, it's really, really quite simple and so for, for the assignment for module three, A3 is to create a calculator that takes input from a user. So all I'm gonna have to do differently here, remember input the function takes an argument that becomes the, it becomes the prompt. prompt. So when I run this, now, there's a problem with this code and it hasn't given me an error yet. Who wants to tell me what the problem with this code is? Yeah. Yeah. When we take input from a user, it is always a string, no matter what they type. If they type 11.0, it's a string. If they type 136, it's a string. So when I go to do this math, it's gonna throw an error and I'll get a type error. So what I would have to do is if I wanna force it to be an int, I can wrap the int function around that input or I could do it here as well. I could do it in both places, but I, I'm converting it to an int twice, which is totally redundant. So it doesn't matter where I do it, but I have to make sure that that is an int. I could make it a float, but 
if I name my variable int, then it should be an int, it should match, so I know what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, so that is some of the stuff that we're gonna work through. And so for assignment three, you're going to just um, find a formula for something online, an interest rate, a car payment calculator, whatever, whatever interests you. It does not have to be a long program. It doesn't really have to be any longer than this one, where you're taking input from a user, you're plugging it into a formula, and you're presenting the result in some kind of meaningful way. One thing that I'd like you to be aware of as you start thinking about this is what we call the first level of, of sort of bulletproofing your projects. Okay, the first level of, of user interface bulletproofing is good input prompts. Now that doesn't do anything to prevent the user from writing car in that in that. So it's not, it's we've got multiple levels. We've got at least three levels that we're gonna go through in this class. But the first level is prompting the user so they know what to put in there. Not a lot of people, like if you showed this to your grandma. She's probably not going to want, unless your grandma's a coder, she's not going to know what an int is. So you want to have good input prompts so that people know what you're expecting them to put in. And that helps your, your code have fewer problems down the road. Now, later on, we are actually going to, the second level is actually checking the input to see if it works. And the third level is, if something slips by all of that, how do you recover from a, from an error in your code or from an error using the input? So those are sort of the three levels. Uh, but the first that we can start right now is having good input prompts. Any questions about this?